Hi, everyone. We're joined today by Dr. Evian Gordon. He was referred to us by the lovely Will Henshaw. He is the founder and chairman of Brain Resource Company and Total Brain. He is the founder of the largest standardized international brain database, the scientific chairman and founding director of the Brain Dynamic Center, Westmean Hospital, and director of BrainNet.net. So yes, do we talk about brains? Absolutely. And we also talk about mental health, but it's my show. So we definitely go down a path you wouldn't expect. So please stay tuned. He's so packed with knowledge. It's an amazing show. And thanks for tuning in. I'm not the house of cards that falls down easily. I'm strong enough to handle what you throw at me. Welcome to Mental Health News Radio. I'm your host, Kristen Sinanta Walker. Just what are we going to discuss? The intimacy that is mental health. Let's continue to make it as comfortable as discussing brain health or heart health. This show has been on the air for several years and we have amazing co hosts. And then we created a network of podcasters on mentalhealthnewsradionetwork.com, a place where every possible facet of mental well being can be talked about openly. My show, after several hundred interviews, the format is this intimate, deep, funny, touching, sometimes uncomfortable, but always vulnerable conversations with interesting people. The goal is to have you, our listening family, many of you who have become my good friends, feel as though you are listening in on private conversations. Thank you for tuning in and becoming part of this amazing journey with me and now with our network of podcasters. Just knowing this podcast might be helping any of you realize you are not alone on this journey called being a human being makes doing this podcast worth every second. Evian, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, it's a pleasure. Now, I was referred to you by the wonderful Will Henshaw. <laughs> oh, he's, uh, he's unique in all ways that matter. <laughs> Absolutely. It was such a great show um, that I did with him. And uh, I love what he's doing with Focus at Will. Yeah, I, I actually had a small input into Focus at Will from a brain point of view. And it's just, it's just fabulous what he's done in all ways. And, uh, He's just a real innovator and visionary, so it's it's great, and I appreciate the introduction. He also is made to speak into a microphone. (laughs) Right, he is true. (laughs) That's correct. Well, he was he was a rock star in his day, so you got to remember. That's right. That's right. That's an advantage most of us in the in the real world don't have. But yes. (laughs) Well, tell our listeners a little bit about you and your work. Well, I have a very simple mission, um, which was to. To try and democratize the brain. I know it sounds a little grandiose, but I was privileged to run a brain institute in the largest hospital in the Southern Hemisphere in Australia, in Sydney, Westmead Hospital. And they were gracious enough and to allow an integrative approach to, to look at the brain as a system, bring people together from different backgrounds. So we moved from the, so I, we, most of the people had a medical and science background like, like I did, but essentially it was to bring together the ideas that matter about the brain and to create a way of measuring it in a standardized manner. And we worked very closely with uh, Dr. Steve Koslow from the inaugural head of the Human Brain Project in Washington, and he was funded to see databases across the United States. And so the long and the short of it is we wanted to create an international database that aggregated about a million data sets in it now and over 300 publications, about 300 scientists around the world. And the goal was not sort of stamp collecting about the brain, but (laughs) to create a, a kind of big data in the days way before big data was, was popular and to extract the insights about the brain that mattered in two ways. So given the science is a given new insights, 300 publications, some of the top researchers around a really amazing group of people, but it's really applied because there's such a gap between what happens in academia and the real world that we want to, the goal that I set this up for is to bridge that gap. So the two final points I'd make is is this, Kristen, that key thing was firstly to create a platform. And that's the reason I moved to San Francisco was at the time when 
these online apps became kind of fashionable. Right. Now it's a kind of cauldron out there. But essentially, we were the first group, um, and thanks to Dr. David Whitehouse, who was the head of innovation at United at the time, um, who got us into a large scale uh, kind of program to create a platform. We created a platform to assess and train the brain for new habits. So everybody knows how hard it is to generate new habits. We wanted to distill the best assessment that linked to this underlying database so we could see what's really working in the brain and how it really works and, and kind of best as we can. There's a lot we don't know, obviously. But that was what the first piece was. Apps for behavior change and assessment on scale online that matter. And number two, moving to mental health. So then to expand the app um, into mental health in a way that it also applied those same tools for behavior change to mental health. And in that light, we've been super lucky. And it's, 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 there was, so there was a not-for-profit piece to the database, mm -hmm. but then there was a for-profit piece of this, this online program called TotalBrain.com. And it's just been, we're very fortunate, the new CEO of TotalBrain.com is an ex-Amazon executive of Louis Gagnon, who's super visionary and very deeply insightful about mental health. And so he's been able to really turn this into more of a consumer thing. It's not available to consumers at the moment, only to big corporates, about 30 US corporates use it. But essentially, I don't want to talk about the product. I just want to give you the sense that right. the goal is so much hype and marketing about mental health. And it's a triumph of marketing over substance, whether it's the pharmaceutical industry or whether it's apps. And so what we try and do is be sort of have an integrative approach as to what works for creating new habits and for boosting mental health. That's my summary. I don't know if that makes sense, but that's the best <laughs> summary I can give you on the day. Best summary I can give you on a Thursday, on a, on a Friday afternoon at the end of the week. That's okay. I love it because obviously everything, you know, that my work is all focused on, you know, the mental health field. That's my passion. And so anyone that's just as passionate about this field is, is always a pleasure to... Well, the whole team is kind of pretty mission driven. Of course, they're very pragmatic mm. as well, but they're very, the, the mental health is the focus at the moment of, uh, of Total Brain. Yeah. So it's, it's been a very interesting journey and very challenging, of course. And there is so much interest in mental health, but it really is, you know, what really works is the, is the great conundrum. We're all, we're all tackling, holding hands a little bit in the dark together, but I think also there's some really deep new insights that are occurring that I think are going to be super helpful. Well, I know that there's um, so much that's on the site, uh, just um, listeners, if you didn't catch it, totalbrain.com, and you can actually um, download the app onto your phone, um, just look up Total Brain. But um, there's a lot there, you know, written about ADHD, um, a lot written about depression. Um, what are, you know, other areas that you're interested so, yeah, in studying great question so, so just if, if if listeners are interested there's a there's a free um access to the app on um totalbrain.com forward slash um forward slash it is bear with me for a second my brain is brain is scrambled for a sake but it's forward slash consumer trial consumer trial so that's to give people a free access to check it out because um, at the moment it's only available to employees and corporates. So essentially, um, the the question you asked is what is there other than depression and ADHD? So in the app, in addition to this kind of the differentiating piece, which is to assess very quickly in 20 minutes, the brain's 12 key capacities. So that's emotion, feeling, cognition, and self-control. And they are 12 capacities underlying those key functions, 12 key brain capacities. And so sort of emotion awareness for emotion, crucial under feeling, for example, stress, like just obvious. Under cognition, everybody knows, you know, attention, memory, and planning. And self-control factors like resilience and do you, can, are you, or do you have a, a kind of growth mindset to socially connect? to people. So those are the 12 capacities. In addition to that, what the, the, the team is now doing with, with Louis is, is building out a screen for mental health, for depression, anxiety, social phobia, ADHD, 
addiction, PTSD, and, um, and sleep apnea. And soon to come will also be mild cognitive impairment. So we're really looking at the most common mental health conditions that are screened within this 20-minute assessment so that people can, can begin with two empowered integrative insights. One, how does my brain's key capacities work and what is my strengths? And what are my weaknesses? So, I mean, that's super empowering. And we've seen that alone. People have got so much benefit from that. So that's just number one. And just knowing that they're working with, you know, this is not just ours. There are a lot of scientists around the world that have contributed to this. So people knowing that there's a credible online simple assessment that has deep links to the world's biggest standardized brain database can be potentially worth looking at. So that's number one. And then number two, flagging with 80% accuracy, what your challenges are in terms of mental health. And then that is coupled with over 30 apps that are exercises, meditation, breath, very important to do breath with meditation, not just meditation alone in my personal view, um, tools for positivity, tools for resilience, um, stress pathway. So there's a whole program of what I call the success habit pathways to then dis that are distilled, that have distilled the key insights about habits so that people can then address. In a, it's not a clinical platform. It's what we call an adjunctive digital therapeutics, these exercises and tools to really help nudge, boost, empower people for continuity of care online that can work with their clinicians or their mental health practitioners or whatever else they choose. It's highly confidential. They direct the way it works. The, the user directs the way it can be used. So it's a sort of, a, a, in summary, if I could distill it this way, Krista, it's a self-empowerment platform to... Um, for brain insight firstly, and then to get some insights into mental health and how you can con have a sort of, sort of an ongoing way to nudge, boost, get the right connections and insights about, about whatever challenges, challenges you face. I don't want to overstate it, but mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the goal. And mm -hmm. the emerging iterations are getting, are getting more and more powerful, but that's, that's the, the intent. How, um, how long has the assessment been out and available? So um, there are about 600,000 people that have used it so far over a number of years. You know, big companies like Boeing, they've got 60,000 employees. They've had like a 30% adoption. Um, the AARP use a white-labeled version of the assessment. So they've done a couple of hundred thousand people themselves. And obviously, as they expand, it'll get expanding pretty dramatically. The AARP website is called stayingsharp.com. So there's a version of it there. So it's many hundreds of thousands of people, but um, it's been available for a couple of years, over four years. And the newest version, this latest, more consumer-friendly version, mm -hmm. thanks to the new team is, uh, of, the, of Louis and developers, is, um, is uh, been around for less than a year. Okay. But it's the same content. It's all the same standardized because the power of what we've done is standardization by keeping everything the same so we can compare over time, see what works relatively speaking so we can compare, you know, different approaches in different disorders because all standardized and then integrative. So we bring all the pieces together. So the content has not changed the ways in which it's become more engaging and um, it has been just changed dramatically, but that's the, in the last year. Right. And that's the nature of, of doing these as well. Yeah. It's all an iterative optimization. He's got to be lucky enough to find a team like, like this sort of super creative veterans. Um, but that, that's rare, but yeah, it's all iterative optimization. I wanted to ask you about that piece. You know, when you put together teams like this, you know, I, I've got a, a, a team that I've just put together to, um, to talk about digital media addiction. And when, we, when I kind of pull back and I look at this team that's been put together, I feel the same way you do. How lucky to have these people come together and, and do this work. 
And it, it made me very interested in how those kinds of things happen. How, you know, how can, how do these um, teams get put together? Why do people agree when they already have their career, their work, their, you know, they're doing, and they're doing something just for the, you know, the betterment of, of humankind. How amazing it is that those things can happen where you gather a group of people sometimes from all over the world that come together decide to to decide to work on a common mission um and why it is that happens how it happens because it seems so far-fetched in some ways that that something like that could be put together you understand what i'm saying oh oh, oh this is my, my, i understand my hair standing up at the back of my neck yeah it's totally <laughs> totally reminiscent so it's a wonderful question you know I mean, I don't have any monopoly of wisdom on this, but I do know that when I set up the Brain Institute at Westmead Hospital and was allowed, empowered by the CEO to bring all these people together from different backgrounds, it was a complete bomb. It was a failure beyond any measure. Really? It was just terrible. People would talk past each other. They would undermine each other's disciplines, you know, the, Every group thought the other group was a bunch of schmucks, and I was really bad, terrible. I mean, they didn't say it in those words, but the, the right. non, you know, we evaluate everything in the in the integrative approach of the brain is what people say is not necessarily what they mean. It's, you know, what they say emotionally, the intention is really very important. So we, putting those two, it was a complete failure until I did one thing, which is standardized data. So the physicists would go with data and they would do their modeling. The mathematicians would go and find new ways to look at the brain. The psychologists had their sort of packages of statistics and insights and questions. Psychiatrists had their issues. And then when people came back and had a common ownership of one thing, in this case, it was the same data and complementary ways to look at it. It was like switching the light on. And uh -huh. that began the whole journey. And similarly, I can see with this new team, you know, to find somebody who's an ex Amazon executive who was, you know, with the highest level at Audible marketing, you know, they're moving from a 200 million to a billion dollar sort of revenue. It's very hard to find people like that who are also visionaries yes. and creative consumer product people so they really keep asking questions the scientists don't really understand or know about user engagement plus the pragmatists we have a guy called Matt Mund who's the sort of chief operating officer from monster.com this massive company that had thousands of corporates they could do like mission control in NASA there it's like unbelievable this guy and then and then also um people like Pablo Sanchez this is like super gifted UX designer and Tian Bach is amazingly gifted creatives with the, the look, feel, integrative insight about what works. It's just magical. So all of them have one other thing in common, like the data for the database. I would say that the thing they all have in common, because they all ran, came from massive other jobs, way beyond our weight provision to do this and the reason was one factor um, was that they're all mission driven at some level they have a reason whereby some aspect of what they're doing they want to do something that makes a difference for real and not just a different sort of in an open-ended discussion way but in a although that's powerful in its own right but um, they want to create they just their backgrounds are perfect for creating tools that can make a difference and they you know there's still a tension axis between the developers the creatives the money people there's always that axis right there's always that right. tension but as an integrationist um you know I, I we deal with different agendas for a living and it is as you said it's tough it's difficult to find the key word that i'll end off with that i find enormously challenging i'd love to hear your thoughts on this is alignment and alignment is alignment of the non-conscious intentionality that people really have under the hood that drives the brain these non-conscious emotions and biases and conditioning and purpose ideas and the rational evidence-based you know sometimes commercial driven agendas very difficult in my view to align all of that and very rare when it works what, what are your thoughts on that well, I, I agree with everything that you've said. I, I think, I mean, we're new burgeoning on the journey that, that we're doing, and we're not talking about anything that isn't already out there and available in the public domain. We're, we're just seeing that 
our addiction to to being online and and our addiction to our phones and our addiction to social media things like that it's not there's the research and there are mass amounts of research which is incredible and then there's a smattering of places um, in different areas of the world that are looking at how to treat this as an addiction as a disorder Mm. but there isn't um there isn't a unifying body that brings those two pieces together that also goes out and does talks about this that delivers this to consumers in a way they can hear it most people when they hear this because you also use your phone you suddenly feel ashamed and you want to avoid listening to talks about <laughs> yeah, that's so true that's the that's the power of the non-conscious emotion brain right it has pushback even exactly. when it, you tell it things that are helpful so that's the challenge of how do we do this and one of the interesting thing about your point about addiction to technology is that one of the things we're doing in a way is creating an addiction for positive habits. So we're trying to make the positive habit an addiction by doing a small steps every day. Mm-hmm. You want to have a dopamine buzz in your brain. Well, that's how addiction works, right? Yes. Except we're hoping that what we're doing is creating positive habits. Yes. That exactly. are addictive but in a positive way. And what I understand that what you're doing, Kristen, is trying to create insight into the addiction to technology to try and rather deploy technology in an, if you're going to be an addict about it in a positive way, but yes, that's my, we, my, none of my, us. My, my summary, is that, is that, is that, is that, is that accurate? <laughs> Absolutely. None of us, because here I come from a technology background. So do many of the other, we, we actually created a, a benefit LLC. So it's a B Corp, which means it's, it operates um, like a nonprofit in that our, um, our net profit is put back out to other uh, to nonprofits and other organizations and work in the world, and but we we aren't. It has this certain designation so that we can take our net proceeds and and put those into social justice, social good, things like that. So so we have that piece. But yes, we thought well, we all use technology. We can't. We we have to be able to talk about this and and get the message delivered and talk about well look here are the benefits to using it too this isn't a shame talk so I actually invited two comedians in the mental health space to be on our membership team for this uh, for this organization as well because I thought well if we're going to go out and we're going to do talks and the goal is to educate and to just show our vulnerability of our own use of technology, we better be able to deliver it in a way that uses humor because otherwise people will flee from those talks. <laughs> so true, so true. <laughs> Isn't it funny that, that, that the non-conscious brain does not like being told what to do because yes. it's a threat. You know, when I say this to people, I say, you know, change is a threat. They go, no, come on, seriously? <laughs> uh, what do you mean change? They go, what about good change? I go, no, even good change. In my early yes. days as a doctor, when I was so shocked, when I would tell people, for example, who were smoking, whatever, look, you've got to stop smoking, you've got to, your cholesterol's all over the place, you've got to lose weight. And they would say, oh, thank you so much. It's so helpful. And then they wouldn't have change. And I'd That's go like, right. what am I missing? And of course, then the field of, of, you know, of motivational interviewing came in, which said, look, if people don't own their solution, their non-conscious brain wants stability. It doesn't want to feel like it's going to fail. So if you set the bar too high, they're going to make an excuse about why not to do it. So all of this, the science of the nuanced way in which we, without patronizing people, by offering a strategy that they can buy into and own is so critical and it is the kind of key to one of the keys is firstly readiness to change. It's so silly to try and push people into change when they're not ready. So you've got to help nudge them to get to ready, right? And then, right. and then when they are ready, even if they are, it, it, this, this, uh, the way, the context, the language, the owning it yourself is just so important and it's non-conscious. So that's the fascination to me of this ongoing dynamic yes. of the non-conscious emotions that hijack us. We're conditioned <laughs> in certain ways. We've got biases. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of ugly down there. And yet 
it's phenomenal. Like it's an incredible cosmos and how to align that with our rational evidence-based needs and our bias towards rationality when our brains are actually driven by these non-conscious emotions and is I, fascinating. I, it it's is. Fascinating. And I think Every day I'm fascinated by it. I know. And it, what fascinates me too is uh, part of the reason why we have this larger pushback about something that is a very real problem is because of the thing that is the very real problem. So we are all so overloaded because of technology, because of social media and um our computer screens, our phones, and we're so overloaded that we, we, the pushback isn't even buried always in our unconscious. It's right there. I can't add another thing to my plate. I can't put another app on my phone. I'm already inundated with information coming at me from all over the globe because I now have access to that kind of information at my fingertips that I carry around with me like an appendage everywhere I go. Don't tell me that I've got to do this exercise or that I've got to. So what we're trying to, to do is, is look at that and say, okay, we're not telling you to stop doing it. We're just asking you to think about it as you're doing it. Oh, that's such a great summary. And I'd say that analogously, I think what, what we're trying to do, Kristen, I'm very analogous is to really, in terms of assessment and training tools, to get people to discover and not be told, but to discover what, really works for them because when people see that they've discovered what works and it resonates with the way their brains work then you have a, a sort of a sort of synchrony so yeah that's a it's a great example of what you're saying to um to get people to power themselves with technology rather than be overloaded exactly and to have power over their technology. I mean, that's debatable. Do we really have power over technology? But at least we can have power over how we utilize it um, in our personal space. We have to do what we have to do for work. But in our personal time where, you know, you are always on your phone, you are going on social media, you're making those conscious choices to, you know, utilize apps and things like that. Well, that's your personal time. So let's help you be aware and conscious and decide and have power over your own personal choices when it comes to these things and see that when it's not because it's become an addiction what is that doing to your mental health and and to deliver that in a way that people hear it and again like we talked about earlier don't go to the shame factor <laughs> yeah that's so spot on so it's it just it fascinates me when the, I guess the the further I get into my career, how many people like you and the team that you work with and these incredible people that I'm working with as well. How much when you I maybe when you've done a lot in your career, you've you've gone through those different ego stages of like you were talking about at the beginning where people were sort of warring factions of well I'm the one that knows and this other group doesn't know maybe once you get past that place because you've really proven to yourself, yeah, I, I know some things. I've, you know, I've got my degree or I've been doing this for a long time. So that ego isn't quite such a ah, on your shoulder. You can then relax into saying, hey, there are people that know more than I do, but I, I do know my piece and let's come together and do something that's socially good. And we don't really need to bring our egos to the table here in that way, because we all have proven to ourselves that we know what we're talking about, at least to a certain degree. Yeah, I think that's just one. You know, it's interesting to me the why I'm, my biased view is that this integrative approach, bringing together all the pieces is so empowering. But it is. It does require a kind of growth mindset. You know, the brain is first and foremost about safety. So if people don't feel safe, it's very hard for them to be in a growth mindset. You know, yes. Carol Dweck coined a growth mindset. But it's sort of an openness. But with an openness and that ability to then have a sort of multidimensional space in your head where you, you can let it all in and then find the pieces that work, I just think that's that's such a such a real empowerment that applies whether it's to working, to resolving and being aware of addiction to technology, or whether it's just making your brain more effective. Yes, it's, it's hard to do without a kind of openness and without a sort of growth mindset. So, right, with, and so without that I think that is curiosity. That without that curiosity, curiosity, very hard, very hard, and yes. that's I think where um, having sort of 
credible sharing of multiple inputs. But on the other hand, you don't want to overload people. So the irony of all this is that while integration and growth mindset seems to be a prerequisite for authentic change, if it's not simple and if they're not very well validated ways, whether you're assessing the brain or whether you're training it or whether you're following a pathway to tell people how to train new habits, <laughs> if it's not all based on the best science, then it just becomes a triumph of marketing over substance. And that yes. is the irony at the end of the day is like, you know, Steve Jobs knew this better than anybody I've ever read about or heard about. Simplicity is king. Like if content is, que is king, maybe simplicity is queen, but whatever it is, <laughs> that combination of content and simplicity is so difficult to get right. It absolutely is. And it takes constant refinement. And I think what can be really difficult in the space that we're both in is technology rapidly evolves. That's oh, super. The, totally, totally. Yeah. So, so and to the speed stay on top is just of like it. crazy. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. You know, no, I know we're running out of time, but I wanted to give you, given that you're looking at addiction to technology, you know, we looked at about 10,000 people with uh, addiction recovery who've used this platform and I suppose the thing the other thing that is really glaring to me is that we talk about change over long time scales you know do these habits and don't do this for your addiction technology but what it increasingly comes down to with respect to our insights from the, in, the big database is that the emotional brain that picks up these non-conscious cues in people in the environment in your situation in a fifth of a second and we've measured a fifth of a second literally it's incredibly mm. quick we have about fifty thousand thoughts a day and in a fifth of a second we are evaluating non-consciously snap judgment so the point is it also change needs to occur in the moment yes. so for addiction it's how do you deal with that craving in the moment i know when i wake up in the morning i wake up at 6 a.m every morning my first temptation is to look at my emails and i yes. am desperately trying to in the moment of craving as I go to the kitchen to make coffee that I do not succumb. And I, it's taking me months oh, no. to train myself, to not allow myself to get stressed, to not think that it's going to be, you know, what fresh hell awaits me today kind of, kind of idea. Right. It's, it's just been a fascinating example that addiction as one example of mental health, you know, with depression, it would mm -hmm. be about not allowing negativity bias to overwhelm you, et cetera, et cetera. But for addiction, it's that craving in the moment. And until yes. we get solutions that are dealing with that level of time resolution, because that decision is made so fast that if the tools ultimately and the insights are not targeted on that moment, then we're, we're going to be less successful than, than if they are. That's why we brought into the team a geneticist. But we have uh, Vanderbilt University and um, a, a large lab company that are very interested in taking it in that, in that direction and looking at the genetics behind it, just specific to this kind of an addiction. And I, I find that utterly fascinating. But why wouldn't there be? There's it's still tying into dopamine and, you know, I don't need to tell you, but all of those things, I find that utterly fascinating and that we can go in that kind of a direction is amazing to me. Oh, that's super interesting. By the way, we have a, a database of a thousand people with depression with their full genetics, 850,000 SNPs. If they're interested in looking, it's the largest genetics, it's the largest depression study that's ever been done mm -hmm. to look at treatment prediction. But anyway, so with that, we're just about to release the first test in depression to predict treatment response, like who may or may not respond to drugs. Because mm -hmm. psychiatry still is the only discipline that has no objective test right. of treatment response. So we hope to release the first. We, we're going to try and replicate it soon uh, well, for uh, addiction. But, but that example of it's taught us that, you know, genes are not our destiny, but we right. ignore them at our peril because, and we've done also done a 1400 twin study with it with genetics and with all these other brain measures and it is it is kind of both a bit challenging a bit kind of confronting mm -hmm. but also very illuminating 
that it is just an integral part of the equation, same as the way we were conditioned, you know, our bonding style, um, early life experience, early trauma. I mean, these are all just part of the mix. And I think it's quite critical to bring all of those factors into the equation when we laser finding the kind of the what works, because I think it just helps make it more personal. And I think it helps make it more effective. Agreed. I mean, maybe there's something that what we're doing can do that's helpful with your work. I, you know, I, I have no idea, but, um, well, we're very interested in, in, in addiction technology because to technology for obvious reasons, you know, we're right. an online large scale user of technology with massive corporates and, and soon consumers. So it's right. just a very, very core issue you, you're, you're pointing to. Yes. And I'm sorry, I talked more about what we're doing, but it's so funny because I, um, when I saw this come up for today and I, I never miss doing a show, um, but I couldn't, you know, last week. And then I saw good, this is on my calendar today. I have a five o'clock with our team, um, for this digital tech initiative and I'm listening to you talk and I'm, and I'm salivating at what I get to tell them at five o'clock after speaking with you. <laughs> Oh, no, it's, it's a great pleasure. It's really wonderful to speak to you, and I, I really appreciate the opportunity. I, I very seldom do these th anymore. I used to do a lot of them, but, uh, you know, whatever Will Henschel, uh, when Will Henschel <laughs> asked me to jump, I just ask how high, you know, he's just, he's just, he's just one of, you know, he's one of the, and his product as well, you know, the whole issue we're looking, I don't know if he told you, probably not, but we've, um, we, we, uh, offered the assessment and the tools to his users and we've just about to look at the first 3,000 people who in focus at will who have done the assessment from total brain to see what kind of music do people preferentially listen to who are depressed who right. are now already I don't know if you've seen on will's channel there's an there's an ADHD channel. Yes, and that I, I have an ADHD. I have listened to so There you go. Too. So you know, it's fascinating. The there you go. And there, because a lot of it is just, you know, increasing arousal in ADHD brings people up into where they need to be right. to optimally process and task closure and all that stuff. So, so he, I think music as a therapy is going to be a really cool and powerful addition to to um to the mix and i'm I kind of working with will and uh, john vitale he's a music producer and co-founder um very closely on this we're going to really we're really looking forward to add um very targeted music therapy or music option to people who want that bit of a boost and who have a very specific kind of kind of mental health issue so that's that's possible in in, in the future that that becomes real I know, and I've I've talked to Will about you know what if we worked on music that specifically targets your addiction to digital media? Mm, Is really that something that we could look at? And he, of course, absolutely. So I have no idea where you know where I'm going with this, and I'm I'm glad that I got to speak to another person that started something with a whole bunch of people that you don't know but have a common goal and fine-tuned it to make it work to do something good for humanity um, I thought oh I have to pick his brain about that piece <laughs> well a lot of overlapping interests is very very interesting and uh, of course we, we we would I'd be happy to try and help as best as, as I could if it, if it fits yeah. and and listeners I want to make sure that you visit dr evian gordon's brain.com it's e-v-i-a-n-g-o-r-d-o-n and um, and then also totalbrain.com. dot com. So it's it's D O N S D O N S. If Dr. Evian Gordon's brain. I'm sorry that my P A set that silly name up, but that is what it is. And so that's the name. Um, but um, there's a lot of videos on there. There's a video section on twenty of the most twenty top brain questions asked and answered. So little short videos on the top twenty brain questions. But the main thing that I'll leave you with, uh, Kristen and your listeners, is to, uh, if you want to please trial out, totalbrain.com forward slash consumer trial. And it's a free trial and uh, we'd, be, we'd love your feedback. Absolutely. I've already signed on for it. So oh. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for joining My me on a, on a late on a Friday. Uh, anytime. Good to speak to you. You too. Thank you. Have a good weekend. 
I know, I know, no one likes commercials, but seriously, folks, without the help from these organizations, we could not stay on the air. Please give a shout out to zencharts.com. If you're a mental health or addiction treatment center, you'll want to use their EHR. It's gorgeous. And they're just good people. And also my genetics, M-Y-G-E-N-E-T-X.com, because knowing your genetic code empowers your mental health treatment. And lastly, copenotes.com. We love getting positive messages right to our phones every day from Johnny Crowder. He's the lead singer of Prison, a heavy metal band sharing their music about suicide prevention, addiction recovery, and mental health. See, that was painless. Support them as they support us. Back to the show. But never without good intentions I heat up and act on my emotions Thanks so much for listening to Mental Health News Radio. Our podcast can be found on iTunes, Stitcher, and hundreds of other podcast apps. Or you can visit our website at mentalhealthnewsradio.com. If you have a question or would like to be a guest, become a podcaster on our network, or join the amazing organizations that help keep us on the air, please email us at info at mhnrnetwork.com. Get ready for that special goodbye from our resident therapy dog, Miles, and a special thanks to Emily Sohn for letting us use her incredible song, Cordial, for our podcast music. Listen to the full song on SoundCloud at emily.sonne. Don't be surprised when I don't hate on you. After all we promised, we'd be cordial.